Hi, everybody. Dr. Nick Riviera. Nick, good to see you. Welcome to Wyoming. It's a great state. My parents live up in Gillette. I live down Colorado. One of these days, I'll get so tired of Colorado, I'll move up north. I love this place. Ranchers hate bankers. It's a good place to live. So my foray into politics a long time ago was in 2007. I was a lot younger, wasn't quite as fat, had a little bit more hair. And I joined the Ron Paul campaign. At the time, there were only 5,000 people in it. It was quite small. And you know what happened? Within a year, we had 2 million people. And everybody knew the name Ron Paul. Campaign for Liberty was formed. We had crazy websites like Break the Matrix. We had the Ron Paul blimp. It was an incredible journey, and I learned a huge amount from it, and some good, some bad. And throughout the years, every now and then, I participated in varying things like audit the Fed. Do you all remember that? Yeah. And the Fed. And the Fed, yeah. Don't, don't even get me started with those guys. And then also the Rand Paul Senate campaign. We won that one, the 2012 Ron Paul campaign. So what was the point? What were we trying to accomplish? What were we doing? We said, you know, this government has lost legitimately. Let's return back to the things that are legitimate. Let's follow the Constitution. That's a pretty simple thing. Let's have sound money. That sounds like a good idea. And hey, you know, all these endless foreign wars, it seems like every president starts one or preserves one, continues one. Let's make that stop. So those were the three pillars of the Ron Paul campaign. Sound money, end the wars, and follow the Constitution. Pretty simple, pretty easy, and it was actually a very bipartisan movement. We had frothing from the mouth communists, and we had hardcore libertarians all in the same tent, two million of them, and we lost. And those who run for office, who desire to change, they tend to lose or they tend to get co-opted. Let's look at the tale of three presidents. All three were change makers. They came in as outsiders and every single person bet against them said, no way, no how, or not their time. The first was Ronald Reagan, and this is in recent memory. Ronald Reagan, he campaigned for Barry Goldwater back in 1964. That's what really got him started. He delivered this magical speech. Well, Barry got his ass kicked. The whole Republican Party got their ass kicked in that, uh, that election cycle, and Nixon put it back together in 66. Reagan didn't go anywhere, though. He kept campaigning and fighting and pushing. And you know what happened? 1980, he ended up actually winning and becoming the president of the United States of America. And he took over the whole Republican Party. And everybody said, wow, things are going to be different now. This guy is completely different from Nixon and Nelson Rockefeller and all these other guys running. And you know what happened? Nothing changed. Military got bigger. Federal government got larger. We still spent more money than we ever spent before. Freedoms and liberties continued to erode away. Everything is business as usual. Then came Barack Obama on the back of the 2008 financial crisis. Now this guy, he pulled a coup. The first coup since the 1930s, since 1932, when FDR won the election on the back of the Great Depression, took out Herbert Hoover. And he comes in with a supermajority in the Senate and the Congress. Supermajority, 60 senators. He had the entire Congress. This guy could have passed a party line vote that we all have to wear hats on Tuesday. And guess what? It would have passed. No filibuster, no nothing. And what was the number one issue the American people cared about? They said our financial system sucks. It's corrupt. These banksters need to go to jail. They took to the streets for it. Remember Occupy Wall Street? Okay. So you have a guy come in. He's completely new, completely independent, very little political history, and he could do whatever the hell he wanted to do. He had control of his political party. So where did he spend his capital? Did he actually form an inquisition, go drag all those banksters, start throwing some in jail, changing our monetary system, reigning in the banks? Nope. No way, no how, didn't happen. We did some healthcare stuff, this, that, the coalition broke apart, and it's a uh, business as usual. So the American people, they say, we're so fucking tired of this. Then in 2016, a reality TV star runs who has never been in office, never been in the military, no political experience, so far outside of the system. You, you had to have made this guy in a lab, okay? 
runs for office, no one takes him seriously, and they say it's going to be Bush versus Clinton. That's the election we're looking for. Okay. And you know what happens? He wins the primary. They say, God, that's crazy. The Republicans are going to get destroyed. Oh, well, I guess President Clinton. He wins the election. And what's the first thing that happens? Rents Priebus becomes his chief of staff, and he gets absorbed into the milieu of the political machine. And now he's starting to look a lot like a traditional Republican president. When you take all the hate, the rhetoric, and all the things the media says, you look at the policy. Who's the head of the Treasury? Stephen Mnuchin from Goldman Sachs. Much change there? Who's the Secretary of State, former head of the CIA, a Republican congressman? Much change there with Pompeo? Really? The reality is we don't actually run the show. We haven't for a long time. We have four branches of government. The fourth is the bureaucratic arm. Millions and millions and millions of people floating around. And those people are unelected and unaccountable. They just do whatever the hell they want to do. You can call them the deep state. You can call them whatever you want. But they control the policy. Whether you can have a mine, you can drill for oil, where you can put your buildings, all the things, environmental policy, fiscal policy, you name it, they run it, and you didn't vote for it. And it doesn't matter who's the president, it doesn't matter the Congress or the Senate, because the system is built that way, and we like to vote to change it, and we ask, well, how do we do that? How do we vote to change? They always tell us, here's a phrase you'll hear from the media, time and again, the most important election of our lifetime. How many fucking times have you heard that? <laughs> Every two years, it's the most important election of our lifetime. Here's what they don't tell you. The percentage of people who vote goes down every two years. People are opting out. They're tired. And then the other thing is they don't talk about other terms. You ever hear rational ignorance? Yeah, I never hear, you know, you never hear that. Why? It's the value of learning the thing is less than the time it takes to learn it. This is a super complicated world. Healthcare is complicated. Monetary policy is complicated. Guys, I have a company that runs in 40 countries. I've been to 52 countries in the last five years. I've met dictators and kings. I've been to Switzerland where they don't even have a leader. They have this concept of primus inter pares, the first among equals. They have a committee that rules Switzerland as a confederacy, and the president is just the head of the committee. Seven people sit on it. I've seen every political system you could imagine, and there's a thousand different ways to solve any problem that comes up. The problem is, to solve problems, you have to invest considerable time and effort. You have to weigh the issues. You actually have to get deep into the guts of it. You have to be willing to take risks. You have to have competent people in the room. You have to understand your biases. You have to understand that you will have winners and losers for any solution that you pick. Who's willing to invest the time when, if you invest the time, your representation and vote is identical to those who don't? It's just that simple. So people opt out. They stop caring. They take vanity votes. They only focus on the surface. They don't get deep. The system is built to avoid you from getting deep. So we think to the future and we ask ourselves, how do we change this? Well, first off, these two political parties, they got together and they said, there's a common set of things we need to agree on. And as long as we agree on that, it's okay. Everything else, who cares? They created an election system where they always win. Two parties will always win. If you're a third party, you're not legitimate. Doesn't matter who you are. George Washington could come out of the grave today and, and somehow run for president in 2024. If he didn't run as a Republican or a Democrat, he would not win. That's just the case of where we're at. So we say, well, how do we change that? Well, you need to change the way that people vote. We need to be able to vote online. We need to change it from Alice versus Bob to preference ordering or other voting systems where you pick a collection of candidates. I like Alice, then Bob, then maybe Jim, then maybe Jane. So there's no more notion of throwing your vote away you suddenly now have ballot diversity. We need to fundamentally change the way that we elect people. What was the first thing the progressives did under Woodrow Wilson once they got power? They said, wow, we really love powerful, strong central governments. 
So what was the counterbalance to America becoming a powerful, strong central government? The senators, they weren't elected by us. They were elected by the states to represent the states and the federal government, act as a counterbalance to an overarching federal bureaucracy. They changed it to popular vote. So it's just a super congressman, five times more powerful, serves three times longer, but basically the same thing. That was not the intent in the Constitution. Okay, so we have to think about how do we elect our people? What is their role and what do they do for us? Why are they here? And you always have to keep a basic common sense idea in the back of your mind. Did I consent to this? Is this making my life better? Are we together on this? Or is this making someone else better, but I didn't consent to it, I don't want this. There's no greater example in 2020 than COVID. Our nation has 700 different policies for COVID, and it's just madness. We're the laughing stock of the world, and rightfully so. Why? I have friends in Hawaii who have gotten tickets for sitting alone on a beach at 7 o'clock in the afternoon for violating quarantine. Apparently, you can get the virus for sitting on a beach, but the very same state, it's perfectly fine to go to a resort pool and hang out with a bunch of people densely packed. That's fine. Mask wearing, what the hell does that mean? Some places want it, some places don't want it. Here in Wyoming, they don't care. If you guys were like this in California, you're like criminals, you're horrible people. How dare you? And then we ask basic questions. Okay, let's talk about the science. Well, who is responsible for that? Who is the arbitrator of these things? We can't even agree if the vaccines are going to be safe and effective or not. If you're a Democrat and Trump is president, they're politicized and going to be horrible and kill all of you. If you are a Democrat and Biden's in office, the vaccines are the godsend and they're here to save all of us. Same vaccines, same companies, same science, same set of facts. Why? Because there's power to be made in dividing people. There's power to be made in making us hate each other. There's power to be made in making us treat each other differently based upon where we're from, what we believe, the color of our skin, the religions we hold. Our founding fathers understood this. They created a system of checks and balances to attempt to prevent us from succumbing to the temptations of that. And what's happened in the last century and certainly with this one is that people have undone those checks and balances systematically and created structures that gain consent by division, created structures that control the flows of information. Now people are being T-platformed. If you have different ideas in the mainstream, go to Twitter and let's see how long you last. Go to Facebook and let's see how long you last. We keep talking about how if only we could get independent candidates in, but the independent candidates are gonna carry alternative visions and messages. And if your alternative visions and messages can be deplatformed at any time, then what do they matter? Will you actually get people around? And let's think about the experience of running for office. We ask, why don't we have better candidates? Why don't we have people who are going to give us what they uh, need? Like the, the, these brilliant business leaders, the Elon Musk of the world, why don't they run the country? You know, I have friends in opposition research, live off K Street. They used to work for the intelligence agencies, the FBI, all these places. Some work for the Mossad. They make much better money in opposition research. You know how they do oppo research? Here's the day you're born. Here's today. Day, 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 all the way down. And they find out every damn thing they can. Not for dirt, for narrative. After they know your entire life story, they say, okay, here's our checklist. Can we make this guy a racist? What in the fact pattern would have let us do it? Can we make him a sexist, a homophobe, a bigot, whatever? And then, then they call up their friends, go from TMZ to the New York Times, prepackaged, ready to go stories. So how the hell do you run for office if you're a controversial person who changes things and takes risks if this is what happens to you? The information channels are deplatformed at a drop of a hat if you don't follow the right narrative. And you have people whose day job is to dig into your entire history and turn you into whatever monster they want you to be. Look at Ben Carson, tale of two people. Ben Carson in the 1990s was an American hero. He was a brilliant 
pediatric neurosurgeon who did the most complex surgeries you could ever do, including operating on children in the womb, fetuses. Imagine that. There was a movie about him, Gifted Hands. Cuba Goody Jr. played him. He was a hero. He runs for president. Suddenly, he's now an idiot, a racist, sleepy Ben Carson. My God, the character assassination on that person was extraordinary. Same person, same beliefs, same politics. It goes from a hero to a national embarrassment. And who were the people who carried it? The Daily Show and all these other people. So we talk about how do we come together as independents and change things. We must change the way we vote. We must change the way the media works. We must change the way that information flows and how we treat each other. And the legitimization or delegitimization of personal attacks upon people. And if we don't do that, you will never get great candidates. And if we don't do that, we will never change those who run the system. And then, once we're back in control of our government, the next thing we need to do is kill the bureaucracy. And how do we do that? Well, we may have to write some constitutional amendments. We may have to hold a constitutional convention. We may have to get term limits. That's a national conversation. But we don't even get the right to have the national conversation when other people control who's legitimate and who's not in the flow of information. So the advantage I have is I'm part of an industry, the cryptocurrency industry. You know what? We just don't like rules here. We rewrite them. We sometimes just don't follow them, fuck them. And it's worked out pretty good. Ten years in, guys in Mongolia own Bitcoin. Camel herders, go figure. We're making some changes here. And one of the things we build are voting systems and ID systems, and we actually talk to nation states. We're in Ethiopia and Mongolia, Uganda, South Africa. And one of these days, we're probably going to end up building election systems for them. In fact, I brought some of my commercial team here. If any of you run a political party and you want to change the way your primaries work, get people voting online, that's what we do. So how I'm going to spend in the next few decades of my life is in the cascading disruption. The idea is that we just do small changes that cascade, and over time they evolve to consume the system. The single most important thing was our money, because if we don't control that, we don't control anything. And we're starting to get control of that again. But now the time has come for us to own our own data, the time has come for us to own our own identities, and the time has come for us to own our own votes. That's simple. And you know what? Everything we do is open source, patent free. And you ask who's in charge? Well, it's very simple, you are. There are no leaders. You don't need them for these types of systems. They're protocols. Who's in charge of the internet? A system of billions of people. What's the internet company? What's internet co? There isn't one. Google would like that and damn, they're trying hard for it. But even they can't do it. So that's the power that I push. And the more people who adopt these paradigms, the more you get back. And every single time trust is violated, whether it be a social network or a central bank or a government itself, we will build protocols to get the trust back and to consume them. And the key is that we just have to work together and we have to avoid the temptations of division. It's actually why I endorsed Brock, because he was the only candidate that said love. He's the only candidate running right now that actually said, let's stop hating each other. I'm sorry, your sexuality, race, and your religion is the least interesting thing about you. Your story is the most interesting thing about you. Where did you come from? Who are you? What have you done? What's your character? These things. And you know what? Your sexuality and race may be part of that story, but it's always different. You may be Barack Obama's kids, or you may have grown up in a Sudanese diaspora. So there's differences there. That's what we should focus on, are the stories and how we can find common ground, and how we can actually love each other, respect each other, and work together, and ask ourselves, how do we live in a better place? As a final point, because I know my time's out, and I wish I had a little bit more, you have to think to the future if you want to accomplish anything. We run businesses, and as a CEO, my job is to look and say, where will the market be in five years, or 10 years, or 15 years? And how do we win? How do we get there? So we, we have to ask ourselves as a nation, where do we want to be in 2100? Not 2022, 2024, but 2100. 
What type of lives do we want to have? What's the day-to-day -day going to be? Do we have a 40-hour work week? Do we have a 10-hour work week? What's the average person's life? And as we're asking that, there's a simple test I'd like each and every one of you to do to help liberate you a little bit from yourself. It's the birth test. Imagine the only thing you know is that you're going to be born into a country. That's it. Okay? You don't know who your parents are, if you have a disability, if you're a man, a woman, the color of your skin, the religion you're going to have. That's the only thing you know is you're born into a country. Would you take that bet? So, compare it. If the only thing you know is you're going to be born in Indonesia versus Canada versus the Democratic Republic of Congo, which one of those countries would you pick? So we ask ourselves, the America of 2100, as we look to that, would you want to be born there? And how do you build a country where the answer is always yes, even given every other country in the world? Just that simple. And then you work your way backwards to how must we treat each other? What tools must we build? And how do we get there? So thank you all for coming. I'm glad to see some faces, new and old. And let's get some lunch, huh?